two words came to mind. Great Commission. I said, okay, Lord, what, what is that? What, what do you want me to share about the Great Commission? He said, I want you to share about the Great Commission, the harvest, and me. So as you read that title today, I want you to put yourself in that picture, the Great Commission, the harvest, and me. This message today focuses on three subjects of great importance to the church. When I say the church, I'm, I, and I think it's in my notes this way, or, or at least in my notes this way, it may not be up there, but notice the church is capitalized. In my notes, I have it two ways. I have it capitalized, and then I have a slash and lowercase. Because I'm talking about the church in two ways. We're talking about capitalized. We're talking about the church, the body of Christ. We're talking about the general body of Christ worldwide. And then the smaller church is us, the local body of believers. And so I believe that the Lord is focusing our attention on the Great Commission. We have heard and we've seen here, we've been praying for the Third Great Awakening. We've been praying for the Holy Spirit to anoint us and to touch us. Uh, as we sang this morning, for the Holy Spirit to fire us up so that we may touch others. That the love, the spirit of love would touch us. And that we, through that spirit of love, touch others. And so this morning I want to share briefly on the Great Commission, the harvest, and what our role is in both the Great Commission and the harvest. It's important that first thing we do is identify who we are in Christ. We at World Outreach Worship Center are a part of the body of Christ, the larger body of Christ, the larger inclusive body of believers around the world. But we're also a local body right here at 1233 Shields Road. And there's a lot of ministry that goes on. Uh, we did a funeral yesterday. I did a funeral yesterday for uh, a family that attended here many, many, many years ago and had a powerful connection to World Outreach Worship Center, then Denby Church of God, and also to Denby Christian Academy. Um, they've had at least 10 or 11 children, gr chil uh, children grandchildren, and great-grandchildren go through DCA. Still have one. They have a great, great I believe, or I think it's a great, great grandchild that's at DCA uh, right now. And um, uh, the, the lady that passed was the granddaughter of R.G. Sperling. If you, any of you have read about the history of the Church of God or read Like a Mighty Army, you know that Richard G. Sperling uh, is the founder of the Holiness Church at Camp Creek, which later became the Church of God. And uh, the lady we did the service for yesterday was his granddaughter. And so it was what an honor to, to do that. And, and just thinking about that service and the connection, it was interesting to see how that one little school that started in 1977 with a preschool with two and three and four-year-old preschool, and the first child was out of that family that we buried laid to rest yesterday. And he, he was here and he spoke about his grandmother and the testimony and the legacy of Christ uh, that, that he laid and how Denby Christian Academy had a powerful role in their lives and still are having in their lives. So that is one way in which we, the local body of Christ, have an impact. But I wanted to, I wanted to bring it to you today in a personal way. I want you to make yourself the subject of this message. I want you to put yourself in the center of what we say today. We are a part of the international body, as we've said, that spreads light of Jesus Christ. Now, Pastor Larry did not know what I was sharing on today, but did you notice the songs? We talked about light, being the light of Christ in the community and the world in which we live. And here we are talking about being light today in our community. We are, corporately as a body of Christ, one of thousands of churches, but also you individually are a light bearer. You are a point of light. And so we are parts with joining with many thousands of people and points of light set on a hill so that all can see Jesus. As believers in Jesus Christ, we have a duty and responsibility to Christ and to our fellow believers to be the light bearers to those who are lost in the darkness of sin. We are the flashlight in God's hand 
shining the light of Christ to illuminate the paths of those around us that do not yet know Jesus. How many of you uh, have used a flashlight in the last week? Okay, in the thunderstorm, some of you, how many of you lost power yesterday? Right in the middle of the funeral, we heard a huge explosion. I was standing here, we were having friend, uh, family remarks being given, and there was a huge explosion right in the middle. Lights went out, sound went out, and we had a weird, I mean, the sun was shining, but we had a lightning bolt hit right here in our community. Knocked out the power off this pole and this pole right here. We had partial power. So we had to cut all, all the ACs off during the service yesterday because we didn't want burn up fan motors. Here we are. We had to have flashlights for a while yesterday. Some of you have had to use flashlights this week maybe. But I want you to think about you being a flashlight. The light of Jesus Christ is in you. And you are his flashlight. We are a force in the world. We, the believers in Jesus Christ, we are a force in the world for Christ. We are a force for Christ in our homes and our families. We are a force in our neighborhoods for the Lord Jesus Christ. We are a force in our workplaces for Jesus Christ. Wherever you are, you are a light bearer for Jesus Christ. We must not forget that. So I ask you the question this morning to evaluate yourself. Where are you? How brightly do you shine? Is the battery charged in your flashlight? How brightly do you burn? All questions we need to ask. What's the wattage in the bulb that's burning for Christ? How many of you uh, remember the incandescent light bulbs? 40, 60 watt light bulbs? Maybe even 100 watt? Okay. All right. Well... How brightly do you shine for the Lord Jesus Christ? What's the brightness of the area around you? See, we want to talk about how this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Remember that? All right. But where do we talk about in that song, where is the light? It's in us. Okay. But how many of us, now let's be real, how many of us have left the light inside? And it only shines right here. It doesn't shine beyond into the community. Let's be real. Does it shine in our house? Do our kids see it? I don't know about you, but I like bright light. I like a high wattage bulb in the fixtures in my home. Ask my wife. She wants me to turn them down or unscrew some bulbs. Okay. I like to see what I'm doing. I want my home well illuminated. Well, I'm learning that the older I get, I've got to be well illuminated in here for others to see Jesus around me and in me. It's a funny thing, though. To be well illuminated, it takes power. If I want a 100-watt bulb and all the light fixtures in my house, I've got to make sure that the electrical system in my house can handle that system. They can handle those light bulbs. It can handle the amount of power. I've got to have a breaker panel and the light switches and all those things. I've got to be able to have it so that it can, the right quantity, so it can, my fixtures will burn and burn brightly. The same is true in our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. To be a bright light for Christ, you've got to be connected to his power supply. Who is his power supply? God only had one son, right? Right? Have you ever thought about it this way, that he was the first foreign man? Do you think about that? He is the son of, I like interaction, come on. He's the son of, and he came from, to, so therefore he is the first foreign missionary. He left heaven to come to earth. He left a holy place to come to a hellish place. He left a blessed place to come to a broken place. He left a sanctified place to come to a sinful place. He left his crown in heaven so that he could be lifted up on a cross on Calvary's hill. Jesus died the way he lived. In the Gospels, Jesus lived with sinners and with saints, didn't he? You often found him in the homes of 
sinners. Okay? Aren't you glad of that? He found a home in my heart, and I was a sinner. He found a home in your heart, you're a sinner. On Calvary, he hung between two thieves. The one on the right received him. The one on the left rejected him. Jesus became the link between those who choose righteousness and those who choose unrighteousness. The cross then became the greatest moral intersection of all time. It's at the cross where people turn right into heaven or turn left into hell. It's at the cross where the light turned green for everyone to have the opportunity to go to heaven and live forever. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 28. In the first 10 verses of Matthew 28, we read of Jesus' resurrection on Sunday morning and the women coming to visit the tomb. Suddenly there is a great earthquake and an angel of the Lord came down from heaven rolled the stone away, and then sat on it. The Roman guards shook with fear when they saw the angel, and they fell into a dead faint. The angel spoke to the women and told them, What? Do not be afraid. That Jesus, the one you are looking for, is not here. But he is, notice I didn't say has, He is risen. Is he still risen today? Yes. Yes. Amen. Just as he said he would. He is risen just as he said he would. So the angel shows them the empty tomb. Says, come and see for yourselves. Shows them the empty tomb and commands them to go quickly and tell his disciples that Jesus is going on ahead of them to a certain mountain in Galilee and that they will see him there. Now let's look down toward verses, the latter part of that chapter, and look at verses 18, 19, and 20. Let's look at the Great Commission. As Jesus was about to ascend into heaven, he pronounced these words in verses 18, 19, and 20, what we call the Great Commission. Jesus is with his disciples on that particular mountain that he instructed previously in Galilee, and it is here that Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. Be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. In these verses, we see a lot of information. Jesus commissioned his disciples to evangelize the entire world. They and we, and we could, you could say me, were not called on to make decisions, but we're called to make disciples. Their accomplishments, our accomplishments, were and are not to be measured by counting, but by conversions. I'm going to ask you a question right here. It's not in my notes, but the Holy Spirit's prompting me. Don't want you to answer it out loud, but I want you to answer it in your heart. How many of you won? How many conversions have you had this year? Answer the question, and let that be a prompting to this word today. It should be our priority and our pursuit to realize our abundant life in Jesus Christ. But it's not just our abundant life. It should be their abundant life as well. We need to set aside our personal agendas. We need to pursue the will of God in our lives. Yes, that may make us uncomfortable. That may mean that we've got to step out of our comfort zone. I, if you know me personally, you know I'm an introvert. I'm a shy bookworm. I really am. I really, really am. But it's what God has done in me that allows me to do this. When I was 10 years old, I couldn't get in front of people. 
I would laugh hysterically. Not because I was, you, you, they were funny. I, I laughed hysterically at choir practice in the Methodist church. And the sanctuary was empty. I was up among the, with the choir and I'd stand before the whole empty seats and was laughing hysterically because I was so nervous I couldn't hardly stand it. The last choir practice, I remember I did something very foolish. I was so, so nervous and scared to be up there with nobody there except the choir director and other kids that when she wasn't looking, I snuck, ran off the platform, snuck under the pews, and ran home. Went out the back door. That's how shy and reserved I was. And in, in really who I really am, now I'm still that way. Ask my wife. If God can take a shy kid, one who actually, if in today's educational terms, would probably be diagnosed with learning disabilities, and can turn me into what I am today and what I have been. You know, God has a sense of humor. If he can take a kid in high school that's got problems, learning problems, and, and can put him in college, call him to, to, to education, call him to minister the word of the Lord, and get up in front of thousands, and I've done that. I've done this in conferences. I've done it in other places. The Lord's allowed me to do that. And if he's been able to, if he can take a little shy kid and do that, he can do that with anybody. I know who I am. I know how I'm shaking in my boots up here this morning. So I, 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 if he can do that with me, he can do that with you. We should understand that it is our priority and our pursuit to realize the abundant life in Christ that we have. But we also know that it's not just for us. It's not just a gift, a possession we control. This may make sense to anyone who reads the Bible, but this thought really runs contrary to the thoughts of most of those in the world that don't know Christ, that don't read the Bible, that have worldly priorities as opposed to biblical priorities. Jesus gave one major assignment to his disciples. Go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them the commandments, teaching them to obey the commandments I've given you. Notice that it's not just the mission but it is also the co-mission. The co here means that we're not alone. That means that we're partnering with others in the global purposes, in global missions. How many of you have been here long enough to know that WOW loves missions? See your hand? Okay. All right. All right. I want to challenge you today to missions. But I want to challenge you to missions right where you live. My challenge is to go out of these four walls. We are to go out. We are to touch. Some. I challenge you this week to talk to somebody you've never talked to before about the Lord Jesus Christ. Share the light of Christ. Touch somebody. May your light bright be so bright that it moves beyond just the perimeter of your feet. And that the shadow and the light pushes back the shadow of someone else that's in the world. God only gave his disciples. If we look only in the historical context, that means the 12, the 70, and the 120. But if we look at it in the practical application, that includes us, doesn't it? Are you his disciple? Then you're also commissioned. We are all commissioned. We are partnering with others. We cannot do the Great Commission alone. But it is doable if we partner together. Notice that when his mission becomes our mission, then we co-mission with him and his church. For every penny, every dime, nickel, dollar, whatever amount you've ever given to world missions, or two missions. It's been a partnering with the church around the world. You're doing something. But I want to challenge us. It's, as Pastor has said, let's be real. It's easy to pull this out, isn't it? It's easy to pull that out. And I am not in any way slighting what we do and what you do when we do offerings. Wow loves to give. And by the way, uh, is John Awena here this morning? 
By the way, Wednesday night, we're going to have some special guests. The McBrayers are going to be with us for a, a little bit Wednesday and share a little bit in, in Wednesday service. They're in Ecuador. They're going to be visiting John and Wayna this week, and they're going to be here in service. But it's easy for us to pull this out. But how many of us are willing to go out, to go with Terry on the first Saturday, or to be a light? I challenge you to be a light first in your home, the lives of your children, your grandchildren, maybe your great-grandchildren. Yesterday, in our neighborhood, we had a very unexpected thing. Trey's next-door neighbor, a neighbor right behind our home, was found dead in her home. Don't know. It looks like suspicious circumstances. But it checked in my own heart. I knew what I was saying today. I never once talked to her about Jesus. I saw her twice, and neither time did I mention her about Jesus. The Holy Spirit checked my spirit. I could have said something to her. I don't know what the circumstances are, and it'll play out over time. But I want us to understand that when we join his mission, it becomes our mission, then we will co-mission with him in the church. How does this apply to us? What is our role? Why should I even be concerned? Well, if you are a follower of Jesus, you should make a difference. People know, or who know, you should be able to see a difference in your living and in your being. Christians are beacons of light in a dark world. That means that Christians stand out. Remember the flashlight? Okay. Not only because we accumulate more of what the world counts, uh, what the world does not count as treasure, we seek the gifts from God. We seek His treasure. That may be contrary to what the world thinks and sees and understands. They, they, maybe we don't accumulate a lot of the world's treasure, but we're seeking the treasure of God in our own hearts. But here's the thing. If we are seeking the treasure of God, then he, we need to be distributors of his gifts. What he gives us is freely given to us. And so therefore we need to freely give it. Helping others search out and find Christ is eternal success. So what I'm asking you to do this morning, what I'm asking you to consider is to be Great Commission driven. Let the Great Commission drive you in your spiritual walk. Help others. Search out others. Help others find Jesus Christ. Help them to find their eternal home. Help to ignite their flame to burn brightly. Remember that passage in Timothy where Paul is writing to him and he says, I, I encourage you, Timothy, to stir up or to fan in the flames. Okay? How many of you have ever been around a campfire? Okay? You... You start small, it builds up, you get a large fire and a large flame. But if you don't attend it, what happens? It dies down. Maybe you went to bed and went to sleep and you woke up the next morning and all you had was left were embers. Maybe there was just a little bit of spark. Well, Paul says to fan into flame the embers. Do you know what fanning does to a fire? You're giving it oxygen, okay? You're, you're giving it life, right? I encourage you this morning to fan into flame the gift of God in you, to allow the Holy Spirit to fan you and to move you. Think for a moment. There is only one place where Jesus Christ will not work in our lives. Do you know where that is? Second place. That's the only place he will not be. Second place. He came to be first in our lives. He came for first place in our lives. So then that means that if he's first and we're second, that means that we kind of measure things differently. The world's going to look at us and think we're weird. The world's going to look at us and think, I, I don't know about their strategy. We don't measure success by the standards of the world, but according to the standards of Christ. 
This is the only effective method that keeps us in a first love relationship with Jesus Christ and keeps our lives focused on the eternal things that matter. Pastor Evenson and Pastor Margie and myself and others in the church, Ellen and others, we've been a part of a, a crime group for several years and uh, that's now transitioned and has been renamed and reorganized and now it's Citizens United for Action here at Newport News. But we were commissioned, but we, we in that function, we and our goal team, we, we wanted to bring change to our community and many, uh, Taylor and several of our young people were involved in that over the last three years because we'd have Rocky out there in the rock truck and the rock team ministering in the communities. But the goal was to do what we called Your Family Matters resource fairs. Well, what I want us to understand is that we've got to go beyond the temporal and we've got to move into the eternal. Yes, our families matter here, but eternity matters. And we need to move forward and have eternal success. Instead of just worrying about the temporary thing, look beyond. Think beyond. Move beyond. The Great Commission servants measure themselves. That means us, we, me. We measure ourselves in light. Now think of this. We measure ourselves in light so as to whether or not we are making it harder for people to live on this planet without hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Are you making it harder for them not to hear it? Or are you making it easier? Let's be real. We face a lot of challenges in life. Let's be real. Putting Christ first is sometimes difficult. You've got a family to take care of. You've got bills to pay. We have a business to run. We've got financial goals. You've got fitness goals. We're all stressed. We all have things. We, we shared in a staff meeting recently just a few of the things that each of us were going through. And every one of the staff members, it seemed like we're in crisis. We had something going on in our personal lives that were, could be very, very powerfully distracting to the ministry. And that's when we realized that is the attack of the enemy. If he can get you distracted, he can get you off task, onto temporal things and not onto eternal things. And so we have made an intentionality in our staff meetings and our prayer times that we're going to be focused and that we're going to commit our personal lives our temporal things to the Lord, entrust them to him so that we're not distracted and not moved away from the eternal things. I sit here and, th and see Lucy and Tammy and the ministry trip you just came back from. The ministry trip that Russell and Sylvia are on yesterday through next Saturday. We are always on the go. We have a lot going on, but I challenge you this morning, church, how busy are you? We may corporately be busy, but how busy are you personally for eternal matters? Let's be real. These things, we can be easily distracted and easily stressed. I recognized this week that, it was, that, that, that brain fog, whatever it was I was in, it, it, was, it was distracting. It started to worry me a little bit, to be honest with you. But I said, Lord, I'm healed in Jesus' name. And Wednesday I was. Thank the Lord. Amen. As in the book of Luke, while Mary focused on the presence of Jesus, the Bible says Martha was very busy and very distracted with all of her serving responsibilities. This is not to take away from the importance of what Mary was doing. Think about it. What was Mary doing? I mean, excuse me, Martha. What was Martha doing? She was serving. Who was she serving? The Lord. All right? But Jesus says to her, and he says to all of us today, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered and anxious about so many things, but only one thing is necessary. 
for Mary has chosen the good part, which is will not will which will not be taken away from her in Luke ten, forty through forty two. Uh, what is the good part? What was Mary doing? She was focused on the presence of Jesus. What was Martha focused on? The Lord gifted me with administrative ability, and I'm not being braggadocious about that. I just recognize that's how he gifted me. And so I try to work in my gifting. Uh, and areas that I'm not necessarily gifted in, I, I rely on others or ask the Lord to give me improvement. <laughs> but I need to stay focused. One of the things about being an introvert is that you don't want to go out. You don't want to get out of your comfort zone. You, you, you want to stay in your little niche. You know, uh, I found it easier not to socialize, not to become friends with anybody as long as I stayed in my book. So, see, really it became an escape. Still like to read today? Yeah. Ask my wife where do I want to go. Well, let's run to the bookstore. She'll say, why don't you sit and pray with me or talk with me or let's do this together. And after about 20 minutes, she'll find me. I'll, I'll go back to that place. Maybe you can relate. Here's the thing. Jesus says that the harvest is great. We are commissioned. We are co-missioning together. We are co-laboring together with each other. But for what purpose? For the harvest. In Matthew 9, verse 37 and 38, Jesus said to his disciples, The harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest and ask him to send more workers into the fields. Look at Luke 10, 2. These were Jesus' instructions to them. The harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his fields. Look at John chapter 4, verse 38, 35 through 38. You know the saying, four months between planting and harvest. But I say, wake up and look around. The fields are already ripe for harvest. The harvesters are paid good wages, and the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. What joy awaits the planter and the harvester alike? You know the saying, one plants and another harvests. And it's true. I sent you to harvest where you didn't plant. Others have already or had already done the work, and now you will get to gather the harvest. My wife and I and my oldest son, we've done some gardening in the last few years. And uh, we like pickles in our households. Uh, and we like to make our own pickles. And so we grow a lot of cucumber plants, pickling cucumbers. And so we, we've pickled, uh, I don't know, in the last three years, we've probably pickled close to 200 jars of pickles. And uh, I think we have maybe six or seven left. <laughs> okay? We like pickles. Okay? We like to garden. We like to grow things. And uh, usually I fund the project, if you know what I mean. And the wife and the son do the planting. And then every once in a while I get to go harvest. I'll pick a cucumber. I'll pick a tomato and enjoy it. All right? With that little comical story, what did I just illustrate? Planters, harvesters. Some do the work of the planting. Some do the work of the harvest. But what did John say in his passage? They both get rewarded. We are at a point in missions, correct me if I'm wrong, Pastor Cookie, but we're at a point where and I'm getting ahead of myself on my message, but we used to send. We were the sender of missionaries, right? But now we're not so much the sender as much as the receiver. We used to send. We used to be the... But there's a paradigm shift in missions. Okay? But a lot of people have gone before us and have planted, and you get to harvest. You may be... Dad, you're here? Oh, there you are. Okay. All right. Pastor Collins planted. Pastor Collins planted in your heart. 
and you saw a harvest. You then pass that on to your kids, your grandkids. You see what I mean? Jesus had so much to say about the harvest, and notice that the harvest has already begun. Jesus says the harvest is great. He said that 2,000 years ago. It is great. Not was great. Okay? It is great. So that means it started with his coming, with his announcing that the kingdom of God is at hand. So the harvest has already started. It has already begun. It means that Jesus came in human flesh and with his message of that, behold, the kingdom is at hand. And he continues, that message will continue until he returns. So since the harvest is already in process, that means then that time is growing of the utmost importance because the harvest began 2,000 years ago. I could have said in this slide and in these notes, the final harvest. In my mind, I believe we are in the last days. We, we, have been, we are in a harvest, but I believe we could really change that to say we are in the final harvest. We are in the final days of the harvest. In Luke chapter 10, verses 3 and 4, Jesus instructs his disciples to go and not take any money with them. Don't take a suitcase. Don't take a pair of extra shoes. Don't stop and chat with anyone or greet anyone on the road. Why did he do that? Is there a sense of urgency about what Jesus said? Okay. In other words, Jesus was saying then in Luke 10, time is short. Get busy. So if it's 2,000 years fast forward, what do you think that means for us today in the 21st century church? We got to get busy. Time is short. How much more urgent is the time today for us to reap the harvest? Here's a thought today. Don't allow things, stuff to deter you from your task. The second thing we notice about the harvest, first we said that the harvest is great. It's already begun. It's happening. It's in process right now. The second thing we find out about the harvest is that the workers are few. There are few workers. Comparatively speaking, the number of Christians in the world today is much less than non-Christians. There's a great need for workers. In both the Matthew and the Luke passages, Jesus commands the believers to pray to the Lord of the harvest that he will send more workers into his field. Now, if you do a cursory read on that passage, to my mind, that doesn't make sense. In my mind, it should just be go. He says, pray to the Lord of the harvest for him to send more workers into the field. So did he just simply ask his disciples to gather for a prayer meeting? Did he do that? Is that what he was really asking? I don't know that Jesus can be sneaky, but I think he was being sneaky right there. Because what does he know? He knows that if you pray to him, he will then what? Send you. See, my thinking, the world, my mind in the, in the flesh says, well, Rather than praying, let's just go. Let's get busy. But what happens if you, without prayer, go? You don't go in his power. You don't go in his authority. You don't oftentimes go with his message or his resources. So you pray Lord, to the Lord of the harvest. Jesus commanded them to pray first because he knew that the Lord then would speak to the hearts of those who were praying. And would call them and commission them and send them. So our first duty as believers is to pray, to seek him for direction. And when we ask Jesus to send more workers into the harvest, we're opening the doors for him to direct us, not just somebody else. If we just go without prayer, we could go off half-cocked, as the saying goes. When we pray to him, we're joining our will with his will, and his will will lead us into the harvest. So Jesus always calls before he sends. He always commissions before he says go. Our second duty as believers is to recognize that the harvest is ripe. 
We do not have to wait to plant first and then harvest. Others have already planted, and the harvest is we as uh, excuse me. Others have already planted, and the harvest is ripe. It's just waiting for the harvesting, the harvesters to come. Look at the urgency at Jesus' word and words in John's passage. But I say, wake up and look around. The fields are already ripe with harvest. Jesus said that two thousand years ago. Wake up. The harvest is already ripe. What happens if you don't harvest wheat, uh, grain, other products? If if you don't harvest it in time, what happens? It spoils. It's lost. We must recognize that when we bring someone to faith in Jesus Christ, we're doing something of eternal consequence. Both the planter and the harvester will rejoice in heaven over those who are saved because of their diligence, prayers, and witness. We must also recognize that as harvesters, we enter into the labors of others. Someone else may plant, and you get the harvest. But maybe you become the planter, and someone else later gets the harvest. You join in the labor of others. We reap where planters sow the seed. Or maybe you sow the seed for other reapers to come, the harvesters to come and do the reaping. All that we do for God is in a large part the result of the preceding sacrificial labor of Jesus Christ and others before us. How many of you came to Christ because somebody else shared a word with you? Can I see your hands? Okay. So that means a large majority of you came to know Jesus Christ because somebody else was willing to go. Somebody else saw the commission. Somebody else was willing to take up their cross and follow Jesus. The third thing about the harvest is that we are co-laboring together. There may be a few of you in the house that will remember this, but when we started Denby Church of God the first Sunday in January in 1974, we spent three years in the courthouse. And... In 1976 and 77, we made plans to build on this property. We built the original brick structure over here. I was a teenager then. Cleared the, cleared the, uh, the lot, cleared the land, hauled the trees off, sold it for firewood to make money to build the church. Still have pictures in my office of where we built that building. But when we put that building in, right above the front entrance was a scripture. Dad, you remember it? 1 Corinthians 3, nine. The key verse for wow for many years, and I think it still has is, and it's probably a large part of our DNA and why we can look up and look at all these flags. You know, people come in uh, this week when I, I told you I did the funeral yesterday and I met with some of the family that had not been at wow before, and they came in, oh, wow, look at the beautiful decorations. I said, they're not decorations. Every flag represents somebody in this congregation. It represents a nation. It represents a people. The key verse that we put Pastor Collins had in the window glass above the front entrance For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. That's been a foundational verse of scripture for this congregation. Since Jesus gave the great commission and the command to reach the harvest 2,000 years ago, we notice a ramping up in urgency to complete the task. We're 2,000 years closer to the return of Christ, and we, and we are in the final days of the harvest. We have seen a shift in our generation in reaching the harvest. Our nation, once the great sender of missionaries, is now the mission field. Our mission field is, the, is now the mission force. Jesus has Christians in every nation of the world. There is a new missionary paradigm call and shift. In the past, the Lord would call missionaries. They just simply pack their bags and ask the Lord, where do you want me to go? Well, today, as missionaries go, they need to ask, where does the Lord already have or who does the Lord already have there? As one missionary 
recently stated, we're moving from parenting to partnering. What does the harvest look like? These are 2018 statistics. Sorry to give you numbers this morning, but in order for us to be informed, we've got to look at a few of them. The worldwide population as of the end of 2018 is 7.56 billion people. The average age of that 7.5 billion people is 29.7 years. Life expectancy is 68 years. Here are the 10 top most populous nations in the world. China, 1,355 1, million. India, 1,236 million. United States, 218 million. I apologize. Brazil, Pakistan, Nigeria, Bangladesh, Russia, and Japan. That little island of Japan has 127 million people. Now, you've heard us use these terms around here. That's known population, but there are some unreached people groups, UPGs. Worldwide total people groups are 16,591 different people groups around the world. Now, of those known groups, there are unreached people groups. And most of those unreached people groups, I'll give you a number and how many there are, but most of them are less than 2% evangelical Christian. There are 6,441 total unreached people groups, UPGs. The population of the UPGs is 3.14 billion people. So the total percentage of the world's UPGs makes up 42.2% of the world's population. Of those 6,400 uh, 741 unreached people groups that have, are unreached, 2,792 of them have not been evangelized. So you see from the numbers, we're making some progress. Numbers are getting a little bit smaller. So there's 2,792 people groups that have not been evangelized. They've never heard the message of Jesus Christ. The total percentage of the world, the unevangelized, makes up 11% of the world's population. In the Church of God in 2016 and since, there's been a, a commitment to finish the Great Commission. I won't go into all the detail. We don't have time. If you're interested, see me or Pastor Cookie. She's got the information too. But there's a finished commitment within the church of God to finish the Great Commission, to gather the final harvest, and to finish the Great Commission. It is within reach. As the world, well, all Christians, number 2.2 .2 billion worldwide, Catholic, Protestants, all together, within 6,876 6, total people groups, making up 20, almost 29% of the world population. But as we go into 2020, next year, just next year, the global church is growing faster than at any other time in the history of the world. Here are some current conversion rates. 45,000 Chinese come to Christ every day. 20,000 Muslims come to Christ every day. There are 60 million Christians in the nation of India. Now, if you go back at the numbers I just told you, it's oh, like 1,200, 1,236 million people, okay? But 60 million of them are Christians. We support Brother Sam Salvaraj in Chennai, India. He's reaching. He's doing his part to reach his people. There are 50 million Christians in North America, not just the United States, but in North America. Get this. By the year 2035, it is projected that Africa will become the first Christian, first ever Christian continent. No matter what the news may say about other groups. Indonesia, a hotbed of Muslim activity where Tommy and Poppy Smith are ministering in, where Dr. Nico is ministering in. He's got 300,000 in his network of churches, okay? In Indonesia, there's more than 20% Christian now. The underground church in the Middle East is growing rapidly. European nations are coming back to life, and the largest churches in Europe right now are being led by African pastors. 
What did I say about the African continent moving toward Christianity? Okay. There are more than 60 million conversions per year. The Christian population is approaching two and a half billion people. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, I don't give you those conversion rates to say we, don't have to, we can just sit back and watch everybody else do it. I'm just saying that the, the urgency is ramped up. The time is ramped up, okay? And we're seeing, that tells me that the Holy Spirit is active all over the world and that he's wooing and moving and drawing people to himself. But he's wooing you and I to be a part of it. We have got to be a part of that last great harvest. He's calling us. We're witnessing a rise in the global church network, which the church of God is a major member the finish line of the Great Commission is within reach of this generation. We can reach those 2,700 unreached people groups. The dynamic is changing. It's no longer the, the West going to the rest. Did you hear that? It's no longer the West going to the rest. It is the best of around the world going to the West. Excuse me, rest. Sorry. That's like them wascally rabbits. So what is it next for me and you? We can see that even though we are seeing wonderful conversion rates, there's still a lot to do, a lot to be done, a lot for us to do. The Great Commission, the harvest, and me. You. Where do we start? You do not have to wonder or ponder or even pray about God calling you. He already has. You, you ever heard, so you've asked somebody to consider ministry and said, well, let me pray about that. Well, I'm telling you, I'm just giving you straight up. You don't have to pray about it. He's already called you. We have the Great Commission. We see the harvest. Our role is to be his servant. He has already commissioned us to be his servants, his disciples. He has already commissioned you and me to go. Now, if God calls you to world missions, wonderful. But that's not my focus today. My focus is for you to be a worker in the harvest, commissioned by him to work in your family. How many of you have an unsaved loved one? They need to know Jesus, all right? You're to be a local missionary. God's already called you. You be a local missionary. You work in your family. How many of you have got co-workers that need Jesus? There's a mission field. How many of you have got neighbors? Like I just told you, we, we got a lost one. We lost a, a neighbor yesterday. Don't know why, but we lost a neighbor yesterday. I, my neighborhood needs... I thank the Lord for the love of Jesus Christ through my wife. She's reached out to three neighbors right around our house. And they feel the influence of the love of the Lord Jesus Christ because she's willing to go. All it takes is conversation. That's all it took. A phone call. Conversation. You can touch somebody in your family, your workplace, your home, your neighborhood just by having a conversation. Remember I asked you, if you were to take a flashlight, I, I should have had one for this illustration. I didn't think of it until now. But if you take the flashlight and turn it upside down, where's the light go? Down. And, it, and its sphere of light is pretty well restricted, isn't it? Okay. So if you turn that flashlight up, what happens? Okay. All right. The, the sphere of light is just restricted, isn't it? And if you point it up, you know, I've got a charging cord for my cell phone at home, and it has a little teeny blue light. In the daylight, you can't even see it in the daytime. At nighttime, it lights up the whole bedroom, right? What happens if the light's in here? Do we want to put it under a bushel? Oh, no. What do we want to do? We want to sing. 
This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Join with me. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. I want us, I want us right here at 1230 Shields Road, I want us to make a difference where we are, right here. Not in the person's life next to you in the pew. We do that corporately. We do that every Sunday and Wednesday and time we come together. But I want us to do it in our family, our workplaces, our neighborhoods, and our city. When J.R. ministers, we've, we've talked about, he's, he's been vocal with us about the reduction of abortion in our area. Why is that? Because you're a missional force for life. Okay? We involve ourselves in that crime group because we want to see reduction in crime in our community. But it's interesting that every one of those members that's a part of that crime group love Jesus. Don't see too many in that group that don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. This morning I want... Uh, if nothing else, I've challenged me. I, I can't talk about you. I've challenged me. I've got to do more for the kingdom. He has put a sense of urgency in me. And I hope I was able to share that a little bit because I believe that's what he gave me to share with you today.